All right, settling down. So the good news is that you only have to listen to me for a few more seconds. <laughs> Applause. Uh, so please welcome Eric, and he'll be talking about uh, the blame game or uh, the um, strangeness around security compliance. Like this? Yes. Oh, hey. Exactly. Slightly scary, this. So, yeah, um, welcome. Uh, the talk was supposed to be the absurdities of uh, compliance. FreeBSD and the, the absurdities of security compliance. This is shorter. It fit on the slide. Um, does this even work? Of course not. Yeah, found it. Also, it needs to be in range or something. Well, hey, sort of. This is very weird. Okay. <laughs> it's infrared, right? <laughs> okay, cool. It's got pressure batteries. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Away with you. So, what I want to cover. <laughs> the power button. There we go. So, I um, want to say something about the business we're in, just a little bit about the security standards that we have been um, um, exposed to throughout the years. Um, shit auditors said, that's looking back a bit. A uh, little bit about how it looks nowadays, and then auditors are still saying shit, so might say something about that. Um, our approach and the tools we use, I'm not going to spend too much time on that because I have no idea what I could possibly be telling you guys, but we'll find out. And then some ideas, some advice for the future if you end up in this situation. I'm here because I've been use, using FreeBSD since the early 2000s, privately mostly, ever since I remote upgraded my Slackware to FreeBSD. That was all sorts of fun. I was bored at work. Um, I absolutely love open source, uh, especially our variety of it. Um, the type of help I'm getting from the community in my daily work is incredible. I absolutely love it. Um, I, was, I landed in the payment industry in 2003. I had no idea I was, I was going to. It was pure coincidence. Um, incredibly steep learning curve. Um, when it comes to the security requirements, it was truly Wild West from my perspective in the beginning. And I'd like to try and show how it's become a little bit Westworld. I'm not sure I'm succeeding. Idea being, someone thinks they're in control now. But when they lose it, it's going to blow up bad. But that's for another time. And I've been speaking about this for years, mostly over beers to people who probably didn't care, so let's see how this works out. <laughs> uh, Modorum, my company, has been doing in-house developed software and hosted it on FreeBSD since around 2003. Uh, all my fault. Uh, when you're shopping online uh, and you're asked to authenticate in some way or other, uh, here in Norway it would typically be using bank ID, there's national ID schemes, you will have similar things in other countries, or simple boring stuff like a password or an OTP sent to you by SMS, something like that, that typically hits us or one of our competitors because what we do is we help the banks authenticate you as cardholders during the payment process. We make software for everyone involved in a payment process, the banks on one side, then you have the merchants and processors like Amazon and PayPal, on the other side of the pond, and then you have the card companies in the middle trying to keep control of everything. Uh, this particular protocol that allows this to happen is called 3D Secure. Some of you might have heard of it. It's also known as Verified by Visa, MasterCard, Secure Code. Back in the day, they all changed names now. 
Um, and sorry, yeah. So the whole idea is to let the banks intercept the payment process so that they can make sure that you're allowed to use whichever card you're currently trying to use when you, when you pay. Um, the banks will sell it to you guys as cardholders as for your security. It really has nothing to do with that. This is all about shifting blame elsewhere. Uh, someone did something absolutely brilliant back in the day. Sorry, I went too fast here. There. Uh, when this protocol was implemented, they gave all the web shops, all the merchants out there, a huge carrot. If they even tried to make use of this protocol, they would automatically lose 90% of the risk with online transactions. Um, which meant that all this risk that had traditionally been on the merchants was shifted to the banks. So the banks had to, you know, scramble to, Im to implement some sort of authentication, and not all of them were able to do that. But they can choose freely how to do this, which is why we have some really crazy authentication schemes out there, including, please wait, an uh, operator from the bank is going to call you. And then you have to wait until you get that phone call, and then they will ask you, okay, what are you up to? And then they might allow your transaction or not. That's quite common in the US, uh, at least it used to be. And now we have this beautiful new PSD, Payment Service Directive 2, in Europe, which means that they have to implement strong authentication. I'm not going to spend time on that, but it's a good thing, finally. And they're nowadays trying to use risk. Look at your payment history and all that stuff to figure out if this is even necessary. But too much about that. This is what we do. <laughs> um, I have spent too much time comparing myself to, you know, doctors who save lives and that sort of thing, but that's what we do. So, sorry about that. Um, in the online payments world that I'm exposed to, you have these three players. You have the guys who decide how we are supposed to do things. Then you have pretty much everyone trying to cover their asses in some way or other, usually by pointing fingers. And then it's us. You know, we're like at the bottom of the food chain. It's when, when all the blame has been shifted somewhere, it, it finds its way to us somehow. Um, I said in my abstract that we prefer to be there. Um, that's probably because we haven't been hit really hard yet. I might change my mind about that, but so far, at least it means we can own our own mistakes. So that is the one nice thing about it. We have a whole bunch of security requirements that apply to us. The most important one that some of you or many of you might have heard of is the PCI DSS, Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard. Uh, it is supposed to cover all the payment industries, including this hotel, and us, and any merchant online, anyone handling card numbers. Um, there are so many exceptions to that that it's not even funny, but we're subject to that one. And it has a sort of a sibling called the 3DS, as in the 3D secure specific requirements. Then we have the different payment schemes, Visa, MasterCard, and the others. They have their own idea of how things should be done. Then we have legal requirements. That's it's always been there, but it's only recently been enforced in any meaningful way. So we're actually somewhat grateful for that. It helps a bit. And then every customer, again, they need to cover their asses, so they have to make it look like they're inventing some sort of requirements that we have to follow, so that we have done something wrong when shit hits the fan. So yeah, the Wild West, that's a while ago. So no relevant security requirements that were being enforced. Maybe except in the US, but not even really there. It was just everyone did whatever they wanted. Uh, there were so many cases of fraud and fallout of various kinds. The, it's, like, it's like violence and theft and stuff back in the day. You didn't hear about it because, you know, no Twitter. Back then you had all this stuff, but it didn't usually make it to the news because online shopping was still kind of tiny. But I, haven't, I don't have the numbers, but I'm pretty sure that a larger percentage of transactions were fraudulent back then than they are now, a huge, by a huge margin. Server under the desk? The industry was literally shit scared about that, and there were so many of them. I mean, I've been in a company where we had servers under people's desk. It doubled as a developer workstation. <laughs> so, yeah. And then you have the, you know, the receipt stacks. In shops, in hotels, you know, you have this receipt stuck on a pin. 
with full card data. Or even they ask you to write down your card number expiry date and this code on the back, the so-called password that they come up with. It's, um, it's absolutely crazy. And crypto? Really? Who has time for that? As in CPU time, really. So we got some requirements. PCI DSS was an attempt to have a coherent approach to all this, but it's dank. It was, oh. Um, again, lots of copy paste, and basically none of the auditors had really any idea about this, but they were well paid, so they were ticking boxes for you. Uh, So-called qualified auditors, they were popping up everywhere. Some of them were you know, in the business for three or four months, so they were auditing a few companies, giving you pre-filled pieces of paper, taking a bunch of money, and then they disappeared again. Absolutely terrible. Then you had the Visa 3D secure requirements. They were actually kind of interesting because they were based on the physical card world, which has been there for a long time. So these requirements were more mature, more thought through, a bit overkill given that you know, this was no, not producing cards and shipping them by mail and that sort of thing. But at least they, they, they were strung together. But we had some interesting audits anyway. Not entirely terrible. But it got so bad because suddenly the card companies, they had to start um, fighting for attention because you had the PCI taking over and you had all sorts of other requirements taking over. And the card companies themselves started being less and less relevant in the security requirements, and they didn't like that at all. So, I mean, I like this picture. Yes, it's by the book. Um, so some of the things we've experienced, this is the first part of the absurdities thing. Um, we've been asked to look for data that cannot possibly exist. Again, requirements come from a different world, the world of physical cards, where you have the magnet strip on the back. So even though we're doing only online stuff, we've been forced to use various approaches to looking for Stripe data on our servers. Um, it, we do look for card numbers stored in log files and all that sort of thing. That's easy, but the Stripe data, now that's hard. Um, we had people come and take pictures with their phones. I mean, back in 2005-ish, 6-ish, phones and cameras, interesting combination. They came into the data center wanted pictures of my password files um, because that should prove that the passwords were encrypted. And then, so at some point, we were asking for an auditor that knew Unix. And I said, I will use grep to look for card numbers. Yeah, but I, you have to document that grep can do regular expressions. Believe it or not, one of the big card companies published a set of official regular expressions to look for card data. And they suggested we got this tool, I don't remember what it was called, Spider or something, some alpha build for FreeBSD existed, binary blob, they wanted us to run this. I suggested using grep. Yeah. We did use grep because we don't run untrusted binaries, usually. Um, <laughs> but yeah. Um, yes, that's the binary blob. Um, we were two guys. We had an office about a third of this stage. But yes, we had to have a visitor badge system for our office. Because otherwise, we couldn't be sure that whoever was in the office was actually employed in our company or not. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, this is my absolute favorite. Um, an auditor was connected to, to the big you know, projector like this, like I am now. And he was bringing up our documentation on his laptop. He was typing in a URL in, um, in his browser. And he thought he had focus on his screen. Too bad focus was over there in the browser window he had there. So he got his browser history. <laughs> <laughs> So the, this was the first PCI audit we ever had. And the auditor took the pictures he took, all the screenshots from our wiki, all the scanned documents, and stuck in a folder on the desktop of his Windows XP laptop, next to a folder for 1, 2, 3, 10, 15, 20 of our competitors, customers, other banks, etc., etc. And then he brought up his browser history on the same laptop. I absolutely love that. Um, when they asked, Yes? Which level of PCI was this? Top level, level one. one. Yeah. 
So uh, when uh, after the audit, I called the boss of this guy and told him about this story, he just said, I think you will not be receiving a quote from us for next year. <laughs> <laughs> so the low point of my career was after a lot of back and forth with these requirements and they were developing and it was getting difficult and especially the ones from Visa, they have, they have essentially three large regions in the world and they each have their own auditing authorities. It's the same document, but different authorities with different interpretations, which meant that our competitors who were usually in the US or Asia or somewhere, they had reasonable auditors that would go in and say, okay, this is the security problem you have to solve, how did you do it? While the guys from Visa Europe, they did not. So we went there to talk to them and explain this and say, hey, you're making our lives really difficult because we have to do things that are absolutely absurd. This was the response I got. We are not in the business of level playing fields. They didn't care and they had no interest in caring. Uh, the same guys also told us, oh, but we don't audit you for the money. We're only taking 15,000 euros of you for the privilege of being audited, plus the time and material of the auditor, plus 100,000 euros protection money every year. So, you know, but not in it for the money at all. <laughs> Love that. Um, so, as time goes by and the requirements develop, some of them grow up. The PCI DSS is getting better. It is currently a decent security standard. Um, our audits tend to be useful to us. Uh, we find stuff, we fix it, we, have, we get help and everything, and they are not as locked down to a Windows group policy as they used to be. Uh, more problem-focused than solution-focused, as in they don't tell you how to do things as much as they used to, but what the problem is and the type of approach you should have. And you can actually do stuff on other platforms than Windows. Um, but they still have a password policy in there that sucks and that you simply cannot do on FreeBSD, which I'm getting back to. The, the other set of requirements from Visa, they are so absurd at this point that you cannot even read them. Uh, they have copy-pasted stuff from their own documents. Indenting doesn't make sense. Grammatically, it doesn't make sense. You're, it's like making pigs fly. It just cannot, you cannot conform. There is no way. Uh, logically impossible. And they actively reduce security. And this is my favorite kind of requirement, of course. A colleague of mine said, what they asked us to do was that we have to have a strong password on the root account. We cannot disable the root account entirely because the requirement says you need a password and that password needs to be split in two halves and given to two different people. So it's like telling us, sorry, telling us to take a solid brick wall, put in a door with a strong lock on it. My preference would still be the brick wall. But you know, this is probably the one time I've outright lied to an auditor and said, yes, we did this. We've never had passwords for root, really. <laughs> these, guys, these guys go for naming, not numbering. <laughs> I get it. <clears throat> Another nice absurdity was when they told us, so I mentioned before OTPs via SMS, one-time passwords when you're shopping or something. These guys didn't understand that this is fundamentally different from a static password where you use the same password all the time. So they told us you have to secure this OTP the same way you would secure a password, which means you have to use an HSM to encrypt them. Now, for those who don't know, an HSM is one of these crypto units that uh, someone else here spoke about um, earlier. Um, they cost a lot of money. They're either a PCI card with some physical security on them, or it's a network-mounted unit. We use the network mount, uh, the, the rack-mounted variety. They cost 80,000 euros a piece, and they suck. Uh, they're slow, and the only thing they're good at is keeping our keys secret. And that's because they have explosives inside. So if you try to take it out of the rack, stuff will blow up inside. It, that's kind of cool. Um, <laughs> so. 
how do we encrypt an OTP and send it to someone? Do we ship an HSM to everyone? I mean, you have like 15 kilos of HSM in your pocket that you pull out every time you... No, that doesn't work, obviously. Oh, we, we've done that. We've done that. <laughs> there was a time the, the supply would not, under any circumstance, ship these HSMs to Tallinn, Estonia. This is a part of the EU. But they were so afraid of this, because it sounded Eastern Bloc and all that, so they refused to ship them, so they shipped to Norway, put them in our check-in luggage, and we flew over. <laughs> <laughs> yes, recipient carrying HSM. Oh, and of course, auditors not understanding how TLS works, that you have a server and a client, the server decides on the crypto, but if we're sending stuff to someone, they decide on the crypto, then we can't make sure they're using an HSM. So the auditor told us, yeah, but how about you be the server and they be the client? <laughs> how do you even compute that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So is there some sort of sanity coming? Um, they're gone. The requirements from, from all the card brands own requirements are basically gone because the PCI has grown up and taken over all this stuff. They all agreed that, okay, we, let, we use the PCI standards, the, all of them, sort of, to achieve much the same. And it has, the PCI has gotten this new extension covering what we do, what Visa used to ask for and the others. And then we got regulation that is almost sane. GDPR is awesome for the consumer for people in general. PSD2 tears down some of these walls that all the banks and other, others in the business have been building up to keep business in their own hands. So it's funny, I'm getting mails from my bank now telling me I can use one online bank to check the, my accounts in another bank because they had to open up uh, APIs and everything to talk between the banks. This is awesome. I mean, it's a tiny island of awesome, but it's still awesome. I like it. And it helps guide all these requirements and temper them. So all the requirements that come out of the US, they are tempered by European regulation. Which means there are some things that even though it's required of us, we simply cannot do it. Like having a camera behind my back in my office. <laughs> that sort of thing. But you still have auditors from hell that really do not understand what they're talking about. They have no idea which means they either have a checklist that you're asked to fill out, or you have, to, you have to take them to school through every single requirement, and this is so tiresome. And then, even though they've sort of given up control, the card companies, they haven't really. So they're inventing all sorts of other ways to keep control. This is the West world. So they think they're in control, they're not really, so they don't even know when things start slipping. And then you all still have all the people who are trying to cover their own assets. They haven't understood that all they need is a certification that we passed a certain set of requirements, so they invent their own. And that's usually copied and pasted, just stuff in a different order, but it's still mostly based on some ancient PCI, so it might not even be compatible anymore. So we've literally been asked to specify the kind of lighting we have outside our premises, and in this case, our office, actually, which is completely irrelevant. And we still don't know, sorry, why they asked this. We have no idea, but we had to try and find out somehow. How, does, how often does police patrol outside your offices? How should I know? This is not the US where you can pay the local sheriff to check by a couple of times a day. Do you have a priority phone number for the emergency services in your area? I was so pissed off when I got this one in my lap because there's a hotel across the road. Please go there first. If there's a fire, go to the hotel. Don't care about us, I don't care. People don't die. And when you have a guy coming into your office and he and his bosses have already decided that your business is worth the, sorry, the data you process for them is worth 400 million US dollars. That is a very big number. Anyone would be interested when they see such a number. So he has this on a piece of paper, 
It says modern MD Pay and our address, phone numbers, everything on top, and then it says the, the, the name of the bank. You know, huge US bank. Everyone's heard of it. And the, the 400 million USD is also in big fat letters, so you can see this from 100 meters away. And this is in his briefcase. And he's carrying this through the airport, and his next stop is St. Petersburg. <laughs> this is the single biggest liability that our company has ever been exposed to. I'm sorry, I'm trying to find that. Oh, never mind. Because imagine someone seeing that document. It's about a company in Tallinn, and it's $400 million. If you can get our, our hands on 1% of that data, and we can get 1% of the value of that data, you can still pay a lot of hackers and hookers and whatever else you need in order to get to us. <laughs> So, um, war stories and all that. How have we gone about doing this? And as I said before, I don't think I can teach a lot of you a lot about FreeBSD, so I won't even go there. Uh, but feel free to ask. So it's about thinking about security first. And then compliance, it's not free, but it's easier. Mostly that one. If you can show that you don't even trust yourself, that goes a long way towards convincing your auditor that at least you don't trust anyone else you shouldn't be trusting. <laughs> and this one has got me out of so much trouble that we, we might choose solutions that don't necessarily follow people's expectations, but being able to explain why we've done certain things, that's a big deal. Because it, 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 it helps show that you have understood the underlying challenge, and you've solved that. It doesn't matter exactly how. And you have to be able to show that your choice is deliberate. You have to be able to show that this is the end of a thought process, not that the thought process started when the auditor raised the question. If you can think quick enough to come up with something at that point, then you're really good and I would like to hire you. And this is something that always brings a lot of discussion, and this depends very much on what industry you're in and what kind of data you have and what kind of attack vectors and everything. But generally, it kind of sucks to find out three years down the lane that you had three, four, five audits. Everyone said it was always hunky-dory, and then someone's been in your systems all the time. Because as soon as you have an audit and you pass, you think everything is fine, because whatever was there, you must have found it by now, right? So people spend a lot of time trying to prevent a break-in, but if you already have, if, if you find um, an, an open hole in your wall, it's not enough to plug it. You have to go check if anyone actually got in. And surprisingly, many don't get this. So detect before you try to spend too much time trying to prevent, because, yeah. You should, of course, try to do both, but um, we have our servers in a data center. We have a rack in a data center with our stuff. And I, at some point, I just have to say, yeah, whatever the data center is doing, it's OK. If someone manages to get to my rack and get to our equipment, they're probably there with a forklift anyway. What can I do? So no amount of you know, kernel auditing is going to help you then. And dual control. Um, physical dual control goes a long way to convincing an auditor that what you're doing is OK, because especially in a small company, when you have to share hats, you wear a lot of hats. Um, if you have dual control, meaning that you need to be two different people from the company to access your server rack, for example, it means you can show with a very high degree of certainty that no one has been playing around there on their own. And then make sure that whatever you really want dual control for, you can't do remotely. So this is one of the nice things with the network mount, uh, the Iraq mounted HSM. There are certain things you simply cannot do. You cannot remotely insert a smart card in it to do administrative, administrative operations. You can't remotely turn physical keys. This is very visual, but it, it's also very nice to just close off entire categories of requirements. So. Um, the tools we use, I didn't say so before, but we have been putting a lot of effort into just staying open source all the way. So a lot of these auditing requirements will assume that you're using some sort of commercial tools for various parts of your compliance work. We didn't do that. So lately, we even have our routers on 
BSD, which is really nice. I, I really like that. Uh, the only closed source software we have is the stuff we develop ourselves, and you may boo. I think it sucks, but then again, I've seen the source, it's okay. <laughs> um, so probably the, the, one, the most important underpinning of being able to comply is about providing forensics data when shit hits the fan. And that's where the kernel audit logs come in. I'm gonna complain about them in a couple of slides, but they're really, really important. And it's, it's easy to turn on, it's very hard to do anything useful with them. Um, then we use FreeBSD update and PKG. I remember spending a couple of weeks trying to implement Tripwire at a point. This is very long time ago, before we had these tools. But those actually do almost everything you need them to do. They can check the integrity of what you have installed. As long as you don't build your own kernel and world and everything, it's actually quite OK. PKG does its job. You need to know a little bit of what you've done yourself and keep track of this, but they can do it. PCI requires a web application firewall. I think the concept is weird, but mod security. You can actually do that with Nginx now uh, on stock FreeBSD, and it works surprisingly well. We had some interesting cases where Nginx would blow up to like 12 gigabytes memory usage per worker or something, but it looks good now. Uh, one of my colleagues is maintaining the libmod security port. MySQL for data, uh, Oracle actually told us at the point that we have the second largest MySQL installation in the world. I don't think that's true any longer, but it's pretty big. I think we're handling like five times 15 terabytes online storage at any given time. And um, MySQL can actually log access, but good luck finding that documented anywhere. You can actually do it. It's, it can log to syslog. And it gives you everything a PCI auditor will ask for, surprisingly. PFSense, Suricata, tools that most of you will know on some level or other. Puppet for config management, uh, ZFS. Uh, whenever Puppet runs in one of our jails, it will tell the host to snapshot the jail before it proceeds. And if that fails, it will just bomb out. That is very nice when you have to show rollback capability. Uh, love Poudrier and Bontrell and all that. It's nothing really out of the ordinary. The kernel auditing is the only thing that we're kind of struggling with and that a lot of people probably don't use. Check the man page. Um, it will give you lots of data, but you can tell it to only you know, save away some of it. So be careful with that. Uh, don't try to do a lot with the data on the server where you're collecting it. Get it out of there and process it elsewhere. One exception being BSM trace, which is seriously undervalued. It can look at the events from the audit pipe and tell you when a certain chain of events happen. So for example, if the triple W user just forks a process, that is bad. That means someone owned my Tomcat. And that is a beautiful way of showing that, hey, I will pick it up if someone gets in that way. You can do similar things with your know, Nginx users or whatever. And that is pretty simple. Or brute force login attempts, that sort of thing. So check it out, it's cute, but I'll get to that. So you have different philosophies in the industry. I'm sorry, I'm going a bit faster and someone showed me a sign here. Um, so probably the biggest one here is again, they need you to have to store away the last 10 passwords used for a user on the system. I don't know how to do that on FreeBSD. 15 years later, I still don't. Everyone expects a large organization. We started out as two people, now we're eight in our hosting business um, doing the work, and it's still small compared to what a lot of the auditors expect. It's not very open source friendly because you cannot equate Linux with open source because Linux comes with corporate stuff. So although the software is technically open source, they don't like the open source community. Um, also because all these HSMs, they require drivers and that sort of stuff unless you use the network units, that kind of sucks. And just because you're compliant doesn't mean you're secure and vice versa. So you have to keep an eye on both. Um, interpretation. 
everyone will interpret the standard differently. Even two auditors from the same company, shall not be <coughs> mentioning names, will have wildly different interpretation of the same requirement. So make sure you know it before they do, what the requirement actually says. And choose your auditor wisely. For PCI, you can actually choose your auditor, which is nice, which means you can make sure they're technical. Make sure they understand technical things, because this is technical. Anyone who tells you differently is wrong. Yes, there's a lot of business processes and all that stuff, but at the end of the day, it's technical. How will your auditor handle alternative solutions? If you haven't done something by the book, what have you done? Are they able to interpret and understand what you have done? And will they help you find a solution? Uh, sometimes the auditor will say, I can't, but my colleague over here can, and that is perfectly fine. Do the, does the auditor trust their own judgment? This is probably the hardest one, because they, again, are part of the blame game. So if we're broken, our auditor will burn. So does the auditor trust their own judgment well enough to actually give you a pass, even if you haven't followed the letter, but actually solved the problem? And if someone warns you about a particular auditor, you should listen to them, because that usually means there's something you need to look out for. But if someone recommends you an auditor, that doesn't come often. Then you really should listen. <laughs> and you are the client. You're paying their bills. So even though you can't demand compliance, you can demand qualified people. I'm not sure what else I really can do about that. But then you have the situations where you cannot choose your auditor, which means you will get some random guy. Chemistry is everything. It can go down the drain the moment you shake the guy's hand. But don't assume. So explain what you've done early and your key concepts, I mean, your decision, your design choices, et cetera. And be prepared to use generic terminology. Um, if they call your platform Linux, don't, don't get too upset. It, it's going to happen. They're going to think it's a Linux. And don't talk about jails if they clearly don't understand what you're talking about. But everyone understands virtual, virtual machines and think that's a good thing. So play them like that. Damn it. Almost every requirement stems from the PCI DSS. So do your homework. Read their requirements and find out where they come from. So you can show that, yeah, this has already been asked and we did it like this. Because it's already covered. They all come from the same place. But they might be different generations of requirements, so it can be interesting anyway. They will typically recognize your PCI certificate, but not necessarily. It depends if they know someone on the board, in which case they might not. It's, um, it is a somewhat small industry, and you people have spoken to each other. So I have a couple of complaints about the current state of affairs. The kernel auditing stuff is awesome, but it's not done. There's not a lot of good documentation or examples. I mean, if you look at the, the trusted BSD website, for example, it's so old, it's not even funny. Um, I'm not sure a lot of people are using this. Who, who's using the auditing framework in any capacity? Excellent, one, two, a few. Not a lot. And come on. I don't know, we're, what, 20 years in? And we still don't log the jail ID of something that's happening? This is just not OK. But I've been yelling about that for 15 years now, and nothing's happening. So I haven't yelled in the right direction, I guess. Package base, I know there was a talk about that here just before I came on. I was panicking over there, so I didn't get it. Someone summarized for me. But I really look forward to that. And then it's the whole jail orchestration thing. There's a lot of interesting um, work going on there. I have a colleague who's working very hard on getting things to work. I can't wait for that. But that's something that we should have had a while ago. The train sort of, it's, it's out there somewhere. We really need to catch up. But we have the basic technology in place, and it's beautiful. So. Thank you, everybody. Everyone who's been contributing, awesome work. 
organizers of this event, thank you very much. It's been very exciting. Um, everyone else pitching in in some way or other. My esteemed colleagues who have been surprisingly quiet through this. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy from Nixu who has been helping me with the slides as I panic the, the, the worst here. That was awesome. So um, thanks for all the beer. And, uh, Do we have time for questions? Yes. Cool. Anyone? Do you have any do you have any suggestions for making the audit process and the compliance part of it better and making, you know, audits better? Uh, can you refer, uh, repeat? I'm not sure I got it. Uh, do you have any suggestions to on how to make the process of auditing or you know making the standards and the auditors more well informed on how it's actually oh, it actually I see works yeah in the so real world. so how, how we can improve the auditing process essentially um, I don't know that's an uphill battle because we are again we're at the bottom of this we where all the blame is being shifted we can't really do a lot uh, until very recently, we haven't had anywhere where we could complain. If we thought our auditor was doing a shit job or was plain old wrong, we could not complain to anyone. It's like, if you have a problem, then just find a different job. So, honestly, I don't know. Is there a set of problems relating to FreeBSD which came up repeatedly during the audits? Something like, if FreeBSD had this workaround or... If we could teach the auditors about this, it would simplify your life? Um, how FreeBSD has been, if at all, a repeated sort of challenge during the audits. Um, it's not a Linux. <laughs> that, that's, that keeps coming up. This is a Linux, right? Well, yeah, so jails, what, what's it actually called? It's like VMware, right? No, not really. Um, the big one that so this whole password history problem is one. But we've solved that by saying, okay, on the application level, we have different password implementations, obviously. On system level, we don't use passwords. We use, you know, hardware SSH keys. So no password policy required. But I have to admit that sometimes it would have been nice to have a more flexible password policy in the PCI where you can say that, okay, Nowadays, people don't change their passwords every month because they use password managers, for example. Or storing the 10 last passwords, that's actually a potential liability in itself. But then you have the other side of the fence where these requirements come from who say that this is the only way to make sure that you actually have new passwords every time. I'm, I'm not sure. I don't like that. Have you thought about just storing the hash? Like, that's not, that's bad, but it's not. <laughs> yeah, sure. But it's the, if, if you attack it using a pattern, you know, you assume people just add a number or something, then it's very easy to verify this. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm very so, so, I did uh, PCI level one for years, and I came up with very creative ways to explain things. Yeah, so <laughs> we just don't. <laughs> what about uh, Kerberos? Do they still require... I use Kerberos because I could enforce uh, the password change time. Yes. And then propagate it. So again, um, Kerberos or LDAP, that sort of thing, could use it. Uh, we have chosen not to because it's simply more complexity than I think it's worth. So we just don't use passwords on the system level. And when we do have passwords on the system level, they can only be used physically on site under dual control, which just removes the whole problem. Then you just argue the password doesn't actually matter because you still need two people and two keys. Uh, when I was at the University of Oslo, what we did with the uh, password changes was that we stored the hashes for, I think, the last three or five hashes. Mm -hmm. And then when uh, the user uh, tried to set a new password, we, we would use the new password as the basis for a dictionary attack on mm. the existing, on the old salted hashes. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. And, Beautiful. And so, we would, so we, we would have, for instance, just adding a number or incrementing a number at the end of the password would have been, that would be rejected because the dictionary attack would, uh, would succeed against yeah. the old passwords. So. I see. Again, um, 
we've had a lot of ugly implementations to try and comply throughout, but removing the whole class of problems by not using passwords has turned out for us to be the simplest solution. Anyone? Uh, what does the standard say and what did you do with respect to passwords that services use to authenticate to each other? Do you use SSH keys or, or TLS or anything to authenticate to MySQL and we everything? We use, uh, so I mentioned I use Puppet uh, everywhere. Puppet has the nice side effect of also being an internal CA. So if you're careful about how you use it, you can actually use that to authenticate all your hosts to each other because every node in the network has a certificate issued under this CA, so you do have mutual TLS level authentication. Um, it depends on your environment whether this is good enough or not. But in our case, that has gone above and beyond what has been required. More? If nothing else, then thank you very much for your attention.